Hello class, welcome to lecture 20. And in this lecture, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, boundaries slash fronts that are not quite the same traditional fronts that we looked at in the previous lecture. So in the previous lecture, we primarily focused on boundaries that separate cold, stable air from uh, warm, moist, unstable air. And as it turns out, there are some boundaries in the atmosphere that don't quite behave in this, uh, in this particular fashion. And that's going to be the main subject for this lecture is we're going to talk about those such boundaries that don't behave like typical cold fronts and warm fronts, which we normally see in the atmosphere. And the first of, uh, first of which boundary that we're going to talk about is the dry line, which is if you've lived in the plains for any length of time, you've probably heard this mentioned at least once. But unlike a cold front, which separates cold, dry air from warm, moist air, the dry line separates uh, hot, dry air from warm, moist, unstable air. And dry line has a lot of unique behaviors to it as well that a cold front doesn't have. And of course, we're going to cover that during the course of this segment. But first, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about how exactly this dry line forms. And the Rocky Mountains play a pretty crucial role in the formation of the dry line. Uh, atop the Rockies, you typically have relatively warm, even in uh, some cases, very hot air, and it's very dry up in the Rocky Mountains. And as you get really strong westerly flow over the mountains, that then brings the air down the other side of the mountains. And as you go from uh, the top of the mountains down to the plains, that air is going to get compressed as it goes, to, goes from an area of lower pressure to higher pressure. And that compression causes additional warming within the air that's coming down the mountains. So you end up with a very hot and dry air mass. And then ahead of, the, ahead of that current of, west air, of westerlies, you've got warm, moist air which is occurring at the surface. And the dry line separates the warm, moist air, which you typically find ahead of, a, of a, ahead of an approaching cyclone. And then behind that cyclone, you'll have a current of hot, dry air. And the dry line is a boundary that separates the really warm, moist air over the plains and the really hot, dry air that's coming from the Rockies. And dry lines most commonly occur in the plains. They're a fairly regular occurrence, especially in the springtime. But these can also occur in other parts of the world. In fact, the Himalayas can also create a, a boundary that resembles a dry line in parts of India, and to some extent the Andes mountain range in South America can also create boundaries that resemble a dry line, but by far the best cases of dry lines do occur over the plains, and that's just due to the unique topography of the plains. The really tall Rocky Mountains out to the west of here, and then you have the Gulf of Mexico supplying a nice contrast to that hot, dry air by allowing warm, moist air to uh, be pulled northward ahead of the hot, dry air. And another, one of the really interesting things about dry lines is if you were to craft a boundary that is most favorable for tornado outbreaks, it would be harder to find a boundary that is more ideal than a dry line. And we're going to highlight some of the reasons for that. For one, the vertical motions, that is the upward motions along a dry line, tend to be weak. And if you have weak upward motions, then you're much more likely to get isolated thunderstorms, which means you're also much more likely to get supercells. And supercell thunderstorms are those rotating thunderstorms that can produce these strong to violent long track tornadoes. Of course, it is possible to get uh, vertical motions that are too weak, in which case you don't get any storms forming at all. But you don't want you don't want motions that are too strong, otherwise too many storms go up and they all interfere with each other. But you also don't want the motions to be too weak, otherwise you don't get any storms at all. But the dry line is a boundary that's able to find that balance better than any other boundary that we might have in the atmosphere. Another interesting thing about the dry line is it tends to retreat westward after sunset. And this is in contrast to a cold front, which tends to accelerate forward after sunset. Once the cooler air cools off even more, uh, the dry line does the opposite. It actually wants to retreat westward on a typical day after sunset. And this means that your thunderstorms are not going to be uh, undercut, which is the uh, sort of an informal term, by stable air. So to sort of contrast this, I'll show you a diagram that sort of illustrates what happens with a cold front. So after sunset, the cold front tends to accelerate forward, which means this current of cold, dry, and stable air is accelerating forward, and that tends to undercut the thunderstorm updraft. So the thunderstorm struggles to get to maintain its fuel supply as this cold and stable air uh, gets underneath it and basically chokes off its supply of warm, moist air. In which case, it does two things. It either dissipates or it becomes elevated, which means it's not drawing in warm, moist air from the surface. So this is one reason. You can get tornado outbreaks from cold fronts, but it's much harder. Uh, dry line is much more ideal for a tornado event of some kind. Uh, 
and contrast this with a dry line, which retreats westward. So now the stable air is moving away from the thunderstorm updraft. So that means the thunderstorm is allowed to be is allowed to remain surface based. It's allowed to keep drawing in warm, moist air from a layer of air near the surface, as opposed to a cold front, which chokes off that fuel supply. It chokes off the supply of warm, moist air, which is originating from the surface. So that's why that's one of the reasons why dry lines are so ideal for tornado events is because they retreat westward and in the process of retreating westward it allows the thunderstorms to continue even after sunset so that means the thunderstorms are able to access those strong low level jet winds which are really conducive for producing low level rotation which also favors the production of tornadoes and of course we'll talk more about how to put all put all that together once we get into some of the later topics of the severe weather unit Another interesting phenomenon that occurs with a dry line is something called a dry line bulge, and this is a consequence of locally stronger mid-level flow. So you might have a corridor of stronger flow, sort of like a jet streak occurring at 500 millibars, and that will in turn produce stronger westerly flow at the surface, and that can create what's refer referred to as a dry line bulge. And we'll look at a diagram that illustrates that, but dry line bulge is significant for a couple reasons. One is uh, it gives you a higher probability of a thunderstorm going up in that region, but it also enhances the amount of vorticity that's present at the low levels, which means you're going to have more directional wind shear, more vorticity for thunderstorms, which means your thunderstorms are going to be uh, much more intense. They're going to be rotating a lot more intensely than they might otherwise be. And another key thing that makes dry lines so ideal is typically a dry line is perpendicular to the flow aloft. And if you're looking for isolated thunderstorms, that is not a squall line, which squall lines can also produce tornadoes, but they don't typically produce strong to violent tornadoes. But when you've got a uh, flow that's perpendicular to a boundary, that means you're much more likely to get isolated thunderstorms. You not guarantee to get isolated thunderstorms, but you're much more likely to get isolated thunderstorms if your boundary and uh, your flow aloft are perpendicular to each other. So typically a dry line extends in the south to north direction and usually the winds aloft are running from west to east so the winds are running per perpendicular to the dry line at the surface. So if you look at this from a top-down perspective during the daytime this is typically what you'll see. You'll see something like uh, what's shown on the screen here. You'll have some sort of cyclone, a nice warm front, and then the dry line which will separate hot, dry, stable air from warm, moist, unstable air. Now I call this stable air. It's actually possible to on occasion get thunderstorms to form in this region of hot, dry air, but it's not really that common to see, but it can occur. And one of the other really interesting things about dry line is where the vertical motions actually take place, where those upward motions actually take place. So if you if you take a look at the density of each air mass that's separated by a boundary, so in the case of a cold front, the warm moist side has a lower density than the cold dry side, and the upward motions on a cold front tend to be on the warm moist side. They tend to be on the warm side of the cold front. Dry line, something really interesting happens. When you take a look at the density of the hot dry air, you typically get a density of, this is just some typical values that you might see in a dry line. So you might see a temperature of mid-90s, dew point, lower 20s, maybe even lower than that on a really extreme case. And then it'll give you a density like so. And then a typical value that you might see in the warm sector, so maybe temperature mid to lower 80s, dew point, lower 70s, upper 60s. And the what's really interesting is this warm moisture is actually denser than the hot dry air. And something that you'll prove as part of your later dynamics courses is when you've got some sort of boundary like this, the upward motions typically occur on the side that has the lower density. So that means in the case of a dry line, the upward motions actually occur on the stable side of the boundary during the daytime, and the downward motions occur on the unstable side of the boundary. And this is thought to be one of the reasons why you tend to get isolated thunderstorms developing. You get those weak, you don't get, tend to get a lot of thunderstorms developing along a dry line is because the circulation is actually upward on the stable side and downward on the unstable side. And you might be wondering, how do you even get thunderstorms forming at all if that's the case? And that has to do with the vertical structure of the dry line itself, which is something you'll talk about in your mesoscale meteorology class in your senior year. But it's really interesting to see that you actually, in the case of a dry line, your upward motions are actually on the stable side of the boundary, as opposed to a cold front or a warm front where the upward motions are typically on the unstable side. And this is sort of depicting what uh, we might refer to as a dry line bulge. Uh, 
So again, you might have a corridor of relatively strong winds at around 500 millibars, which again might show up as, or might resemble a jet streak. And when those really stronger winds come down to the surface, which is how a dry line forms, that can result in what's referred to as a dry line bulge, which is so named because the dry line is bulged. And as a result, that typically results in more of a southeasterly flow right at the apex of the bulge, right on the northern side of the bulge. And so now you've got southeasterly flow that's veering to the west aloft. So you've got really strong directional shear that's present in the lowest one to three kilometers when you've got a dry line bulge. And on the south side of the bulge, you don't get as much directional shear, but you might still get enough directional shear to favor rotating thunderstorms like supercells. And the, probably what's most interesting about the dry line is what happens at night. Well, for one thing, it tends to regress westward during the night. So it tends to move from east to west during the nighttime and then from west to east during the daytime. And as this uh, region of hot, dry air cools off, since the air is really dry, it tends to cool off much more rapidly than the air that's uh, warm and moist ahead of the cyclone or ahead of the dry line. And as a result, the density rises really quickly. It gets really cold and it gets really dry. So now the, the, the side with the greatest density is now on the cold side, the stable side, and now the warm side now has the, uh, the lower density. And again, the vertical circulate, the upward motions typically occur on the side with the uh, less dense air. So that means at nighttime, the vertical circulation, the dry line, actually reverses direction. So in the daytime, you've got rising motion on the hot, dry side, sinking motion on the warm, moist side. But during the nighttime, on the stable side, you've got sinking motions, and on the unstable side, now you've got rising motions. And on occasion, you can get uh, widespread thunderstorm activity developing after nighttime in the case of a dry line, but that usually doesn't happen it's because the atmosphere by that time is stable on the warm, moist side, and you can't get any new thunderstorms to form. But on occasion, you can get new thunderstorms forming even after, uh, even after sunset. And again, this is really ideal because you may also remember from our lecture on the low-level jet, right at nighttime is when that low-level wind field intensifies, that wind at 850 millibars that we call the low-level jet, that intensifies. And since the dry land regresses westward with nighttime, then that means uh, the ongoing thunderstorms are not going to be interfered with by other storms or not going to be undercut by the stable air. So any isolated storms that are present... Uh, as that low-level jet is ramping up, have a much higher chance of producing strong to violent long-track tornadoes if the other atmosphere conditions are favorable. But that's going to do it on this top on this uh, topic of dry lines. And uh, in the next segment, we're going to talk a little bit about outflow boundaries, which are very similar to cold fronts, but there are a few important differences that we have to keep in mind. So with that, I will see you all in the next segment.